Good afternoon, everyone. We're going to just wait a few more moments and then we'll go ahead and get started. All right, thank you all for joining us today. Uh, Tony DeBura, the co-director of the Institute for Assured Autonomy will introduce today's speaker, Nicole. Great, thank you, Veronica, and welcome uh, everyone to this seminar jointly sponsored by the Johns Hopkins University Information Security Institute and the Johns Hopkins Institute for Assured Autonomy. Today, we feature our guest speaker, Nicole Perlroth, Perlroth of the New York Times. Uh, before we begin, I'd like to encourage you to submit any questions for Nicole using the Q&A feature on your screen and I'll field questions at the end of her talk and we'll do my best to get to all of them. Also, I'd like to introduce others joining me uh, today on the virtual stage. First, I'd like to introduce my colleague, Dr. Terry Thompson, who is working with me on a project called the Cyber Attack Predictive Index or CAPI. The goal of CAPI is to use a methodology we developed to predict nation states that are likely to engage as aggressors in cyber conflict against other nation states. We work with a group of Hopkins students who should be part of the audience today to maintain a website with a scoreboard of current likely conflicts. And I'll post the link to the chat uh, in the chat uh, if you're interested. Also others uh, here with me today are Carol Lapointe, the co-director of the Institute for Assured Autonomy, David Silberberg and Ashutosh Duda. And now it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker. Nicole Pearl Roth is an award-winning cybersecurity journalist for the New York Times, where her work has been optioned for both film and television. She's a regular lecturer at the Stanford Graduate School of Business and a is a graduate of Princeton University and Stanford University. She is also the author of a new book. This is how they tell me the world ends, right here. The untold story of the global cyber arms trade and cyber weapons arm race spanning three decades. Pearl Ross reporting spans the period from the 1990s to the 2020 election and its aftermath when Russia has been engaged in a months long hack of the United States federal government itself, an attack that Pearl Roth continues to report for the New York Times, building on her book's extraordinary revelations. And with that, I'll turn it over to you, Nicole. Thank you so much, Tony and Terry and Carol, David and everyone from Johns Hopkins. It's great to be with you today. And Thank you for taking time out of your day of Zoom calls to join yet another Zoom call. I really appreciate it. Um, so I just wanted to walk people through why I wrote the book, uh, the process of writing the book, and where I think the topic is headed. I joined the Times in 2010, and I had been covering startups and venture capital from Silicon Valley and I had written some high profile cover stories and the Times called me and they said, we're looking at you for a job, but we're not sure you're going to want it. And I said, well, you're the New York Times, so I'll probably take whatever it is, how bad could it be? And they said, it's cybersecurity. And I just remember laughing and saying, why on earth would you want to hire me to cover cybersecurity? Not only do I not know anything about cybersecurity, I've actively gone out of my way to not know anything about cybersecurity. But sure, I'll go do the interviews. And so I went to New York and I did the interviews. And I remember telling interviewers throughout the span of those two days, you know, I think I, I know a couple of very qualified cybersecurity reporters. You should hire them for this role. I'm really not qualified. And they said, no, 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 you don't understand. We've interviewed all of them and we didn't understand a single thing they were saying. You're hired. So, so began my illustrative uh, entry to the, to the New York Times. And one of the first thing that, things that happened when I joined the Times was we were hacked by China. And so I spent several months embedded with our security team, with Mandiant, which is now FireEye, 
and the FBI unwinding this nation state attack on our own systems where the guy we called the Beijing summer intern would roll into the New York Times network at 10 a.m. Beijing time and roll out around 4.30 Beijing time in search of our sources. And since then, the threat landscape has only gotten worse. But that was really my first eye-opening experience with the fact that companies no longer needed to just defend themselves from cyber criminals and fraud and the theft of personal data and financial data, but we had to now defend ourselves from nation states. And since then, the problem has only gotten worse. We saw Iran attack Saudi Aramco, decimate its computer servers and information and replace it with an uh, image of a burning American flag, which I know is one of the case studies that Johns Hopkins has dug into. Um, we've seen Sony, the Sony attack by North Korea. We saw the attacks by Russia and our elections and increasingly our power grid. Um, and now we are unwinding this attack on our federal IT networks, the attacks we're calling solar winds, which have now impacted the State Department, the Justice Department, Treasury, Commerce, the Department of Energy, the nuclear labs, Department of Homeland Security, the agency charged with keeping us safe. So my motivation in writing this book is I had covered these attacks, many of them on the front pages of the New York Times, but I felt like I wasn't adequately communicating to readers, most of them lay people who have no computer science background whatsoever, the extent of the threat, the fact that this was getting worse and that security wasn't getting any better. And one of the things I really wanted to dig into was the incentive structures. I'd covered numerous attempts by legislators to try to pass these bills that would have given our critical infrastructure better protection. But unfortunately, something like 80% of critical infrastructure in the United States is owned and maintained by the private sector. And every time we try to pass this legislation, uh, lobbyists, usually from the US Chamber of Commerce, would come in and say, no, 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 this is too burdensome for these companies. Um, and ultimately, the, these bills would get watered down to the point of being utterly useless. Um, and any sort of legislation we've had when it comes to locking up our critical infrastructure has come in the form of an executive order that essentially just identifies critical infrastructure and puts forth you know, best practice recommendations for how to secure it. Um, but I knew from covering these attacks that each one was getting to be a slightly more dangerous or costlier version than the last. And clearly um, government wasn't in a position to actually uh, make us more secure. And I knew from being in Silicon Valley and covering the Valley for so long that there the biggest incentive was this promise of a frictionless society. You know, their incentive was to get these tools onto our phones that would allow us to not just order an Uber and do everything possible from our, from our smartphones, but also that increasingly we were being given the tools to access our critical infrastructure remotely. You know, our power grid, the pressure and temperature and chemical levels at a water treatment plant or a chemical plant. And we were marching on and on and on into this sort of new virtualized world order without meaningful consideration for how all of those virtual access points could be exploited. I knew that businesses, their main incentive was to just get the product out to market first, the whole move fast and break things mantra that Mark Zuckerberg talks about a lot. And I knew in government that there were factions of government that yes, were aware of how bad the cybersecurity threat was, um, knew that things were getting worse. But one of the things I was really fascinated by was this little discussed uh, market for vulnerabilities, the zero day market. And you know, given the audience, most of you probably know what a zero day is, but I'll just stop and pause here um, and give you my little spiel about it. So a zero day is just a flaw in code that a manufacturer like Apple doesn't yet know about it. And so just the easiest example would be if I find a flaw in your iPhone's iOS software and I hacker know how to write the code or the program to exploit it remotely, 
I could potentially access your text messages, track your location, turn on your video or audio without you knowing, trace your contacts, read your emails, et cetera. And that zero day exploit, that program to exploit that vulnerability, the going rate for that on the market today is $2.5 million in the United States. I can sell that to a zero day broker who will sell it to government agencies, both in the United States, but also abroad. And they'll buy it for me for $2.5 million. But also that means that they won't tell Apple about it. Apple won't know that there is a problem with its software that could be exploited for espionage or surveillance. And the going rate for these exploits was only going up. And I also saw that the market was drifting elsewhere. There's actually a broker I find in the book or in the report, course of reporting the book that works exclusively for Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates. And they will buy your iOS zero day exploit for $3 million. So we're being outbid in a way by some of these other governments. And I knew that the US government partake, partook in this market and I knew that no one wanted to talk about this market because inherently it leaves all of us less secure. Now, three decades ago, if the US government found or acquired a zero day exploit in let's say Huawei software used by China, but also some of our adversaries in North Korea and Iran, if we found a hole in Huawei software that we could exploit to spy on our adversaries, there was no harm, no foul to Americans because for the most part, we weren't using Huawei software. And the same was true for Russia and the United States. We were all using different technology for the most part. But I knew that particularly over the last decade, we've all migrated to the same technology. We're all using iPhones and Androids and whether you know it or not, you're using Microsoft Windows in your day-to-day -day life. And not only that, but that software is getting rolled into our critical infrastructure, into our power grid, into our nuclear plants, into our water treatment facilities, into our chemical plants. So when a hacker finds a hole in that industrial software or just in Microsoft Windows, and they sell it to a broker or sell it directly to a government, it means that you're also leaving Americans less safe. So I was fascinated by this moral hazard. How does the US government deal with this moral hazard? At what point does it decide that a zero day exploit is so critical to its espionage programs and increasingly to its battlefield programs because we were using these tools to essentially implant ourselves into the Iranian grid. And a couple of years ago, my colleague David Singer and I broke the story that we were also hacking into the Russian grid. Um, so at what point does the US government decide that this zero day exploit is so critical to its espionage and counterintelligence and battlefield preparations that it will keep it? And at what point does it decide it will turn it over to the manufacturer for patching and that patch gets rolled into a software update and we install it uh, ourselves? So um, there was another thing that was sort of gnawing on me, which was the fact that there was a very lucrative, a sophisticated market growing around these tools. We were seeing in Europe hacking team, uh, which was a pur purveyor of essentially click and shoot mobile spyware, uh, pop up on the phones of dissidents and journalists, um, many of them in countries that uh, do not have the same human rights track records or red tape as we do here in the US or that our Five Eyes partners might have. Um, also NSO group in Israel, I continued to unearth their spyware on dissidents in the UAE, um, Saudi Arabia, there was a tie-in between NSO spyware and someone Jamal Khashoggi was communicating with. And in one of the weirdest examples, I had been getting calls from people in Mexico who I didn't really understand at first what they had in common. They were nutritionists, some were doctors, some were consumer rights activists. And then I realized I, I partnered with some digital rights activists in Mexico and Citizen Lab. And we realized that they had indeed had NSO's mobile spyware installed on their phones. They had clicked on links that had inadvertently downloaded the spyware onto their devices. And the only thing they had in common 
was the fact that they had all at some point publicly advocated for a soda tax in Mexico. And when I went back to NSO group, they told me we only sell the spyware to government agencies and we don't discuss our customers. But it was very clear to me that someone in Mexico was clearly using the spyware for corrupt purposes. And there was no real kill switch if a journalist went to NSO group and said, hey, I'm finding your spyware on the phones of these journalists and human rights lawyers and nutritionists. There was no way for NSO to essentially march into an intelligence or law enforcement agency in Mexico, ripped, rip their hardware out of the wall. There was no real way to do that. So the only thing they could do in that circumstance was really wean their clients off their spyware by slowly denying them software updates and new features. And what this all showed me was that there was very little oversight or regulation or even anyone watching where this market was going. So I was fascinated by um, wanting to know the history of this market. Uh, as a journalist, one thing that really attracted me to it was the fact that this was a market that nobody wanted to talk about. And they had good reason. There was a story by my former colleague uh, at Forbes, Andy Greenberg, where he had profiled the Gruck, which some of you may know is a used to be a zero day broker. He's on Twitter. He has 100,000 followers. He's considered a thought leader in the information security industry. And more than 10 years ago, he allowed himself to be interviewed and photographed for Forbes magazine. And he talked about the zero day market. He talked about the fact that he was procuring zero day exploits from hackers and selling them to governments. And later he would say that he thought he was speaking off the record, but he was also happy to pose next to this giant duffel bag of cash. And I learned that after that story came out, governments stopped doing business with him. No one wanted to do business with anyone that spoke to journalists or the press about this business because the minute you talk to the press, the minute you make this business known, the minute you discuss some of the exploits that you are buying and the software that is vulnerable that they exploit, the, the secret gets out, the manufacturer will patch the zero day exploit and that exploit you just paid $2 million for essentially turns to dust. So I knew this was an industry that nobody wanted to talk about. I also knew that a lot of these deals were wrapped up in non-disclosure agreements and increasingly part of classified intelligence programs. But um, my first sort of nagging experience that I needed to dig into this further was in 2013, I was invited into a storage closet at the New York Times that belonged to Arthur Sulzberger. Um, we had been given a slice of the Snowden documents. Uh, you might remember that Snowden gave um, these documents to Glenn Greenwald, who was then at The Guardian. Um, the Guardian was headquartered in the UK. The UK's press freedoms, I learned, were significantly fewer than we enjoy here in the United States. Uh, the GCHQ visited their offices and demanded that they destroy these hard drives that they'd gotten from Snowden and actually looked over their shoulders while they took whirring blades to the hard drives. And uh, the Guardian did that. They destroyed the hard drives. But what they didn't tell the GCHQ at the time was that they had smuggled a copy of the hard drive to the New York Times. And so I was invited into this closet. Now, one fun fact here is that one of the things that the Guardian mandated was that we work out of a room without windows. They were really worried about people shooting lasers at windows and listening to everything we were saying. And they demanded that we work out of a room without windows. Well, the New York Times building in Manhattan, if you've ever been there or walked by it, you know that it is floor to ceiling glass. The whole building was designed by Renzo Piano as a model for full transparency. So there are no windowless rooms in the building with the exception of bathrooms and then this tiny storage closet <laughs> belonging to our publisher. So for several months, I was stuck into the storage closet with um, journalists from ProPublica and also The Guardian and my colleague Scott Chain and some of our editors as we poured through these documents. And I think one thing people don't realize was these documents were 
pulled completely out of context. They were PowerPoint slides, they were memos, they were internal wikis. There was really no context around them. And it was clear to me that Snowden didn't have as high level of an access as you might imagine uh, from the press coverage. When we were pulled into that project, we were assigned to do two stories. One uh, by me was going to be about how far the NSA and GCHQ had gotten in cracking digital encryption. And my colleague Scott Chain was assigned to a story about sort of the broad expanse of the NSA's capabilities. But for my particular assignment, what I saw was an agency that clearly was trying to work its way around encryption, either by lobbying um, some of these bodies that establish um, encryption standards to use random number generators that the NSA could break. In some cases, it was getting around encryption by hacking into the companies themselves or the links between their data centers. But one of the things that kept catching my attention were these littered references to um, our third party malware developers or our commercial partners who provide these capabilities. And it was clear to me that these were references to the zero day market or to this market where the US government essentially contracts out some of these click and shoot off the shelf surveillance tools to defense contractors, but there was really no context in these documents. And so the day I walked out of that closet in 2013, I committed to essentially digging into this market to try and tell the history of the market and to see where it was headed. And so what I learned was uh, in the 1990s, the US essentially started buying zero day exploits from hackers, many of them through defense contractors, boutique contractors that most of us have never even heard of. Uh, we're sending middlemen over to Eastern Europe or to Israel to procure zero day exploits. Sometimes it was a, for a directed operation if we wanted to monitor uh, Russian diplomats at the Russian embassy in Kiev then we would find out what software and hardware they were using and we would send this middleman overseas to Eastern Europe to try and get a zero day exploit in that software so we could spy on those systems. Sometimes it was, they would find a zero day in Microsoft Windows or a ubiquitous piece of software and they would sell it to numerous agencies, mostly the Pentagon and intelligence agencies, but also law enforcement, which we learned in 2015, you know, the FBI had a real impetus to get into people's devices, um, terrorists, child predators, that kind of thing. So they essentially catapulted this market in the 90s. And the embassy bombings in um, the late 90s also helped catalyze this industry because suddenly we realized we didn't have the insight that we wanted um, into sort of this post Cold War world order where enemies were popping up in places we never expected them to. 9-11 was a big moment. Um, and all of this just kept catalyzing this market. And the other thing that I noticed was that on the other side was industry. You know, for a long time, companies like Microsoft and Sun and HP and Oracle didn't want to hear it when hackers or security researchers or just programmers would find flaws in their systems. There was no real channel to call up the co co company and say, hey, I just found a massive flaw in your code that I could use to break into NASA. There was no established channel for that. And often what would happen when hackers would call these companies to flag problems in their code was they would get a call back from an attorney or usually they were just ignored. But over the same time period, government clearly saw value in what hackers were doing for their own espionage programs. Now, the thing that really changed was Stuxnet. And you know, I'm assuming most of you know, but Stuxnet was the US-Israeli uh, joint cyber operation that used code to get into Natan's nuclear centrifuges, into the rotor, the computers that control the speed of the rotors. And in some cases, they sped up those rotors and destroyed the centrifuges that way. Um, in other cases, they slowed them down and, and destroyed 
um, the uranium enrichment process that way. And it was fascinating in the book to go back to that period in history, which almost feels odd calling it history because it was in 2006, 2007, it was not too distant history. But, uh, you know, at the time, we were seeing US death counts in Iraq climb to unprecedented levels. We were already overstretched in the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq. And Israel was putting increasing pressure on us to hand over our bunker buster bombs. And every simulation that the Pentagon did over that time period to, to show what would happen if we gave Israel these bombs and these capabilities and they dropped them on Natanz showed that we would be dragged into World War III. And that was the last thing that George W. Bush wanted in his second administration would be to get dragged into a third war in the Middle East. So he famously said, get me a third option. And the third option was Stuxnet. And it was brilliant. You know, it kept Israeli jets on the ground because we pulled in Israel to the project. We destroyed ultimately something like a thousand of Iran centrifuges. We set back their nuclear ambitions uh, years. And we also probably saved thousands of lives um, by pursuing this project through code instead of through uh, kinetic warfare. But the problem was that as most cyber attacks do, it got out, the worm got out. And it was designed so carefully. When you, when you go back and you read through the forensics, you just know that they were designing this code with lawyers at the NSA sitting over their shoulder to make sure it only destroyed systems that met the exact configuration requirements of the centrifuges at Natanz. But it got out, it spread all over the world into computer systems in India, all throughout Asia, it hit Chevron, um, and it never did any destruction. But what it did was uh, it showed the world and Iran and our adversaries uh, what could be done with code. And not only that, it set a new bar for what was permissible in cyberspace. Suddenly it was okay to leap into another nation's critical infrastructure, even their nuclear plants, and take out those systems so long as you did it with code. And since Stuxnet was discovered in 2010, we have seen adversaries latch on to the potential of cyber weapons not just for espionage, and in that case, I don't even consider them cyber weapons, I consider them hacking tools or surveillance tools. But increasingly, we have seen our adversaries use code to break into our own critical infrastructure. We have seen Iran hack into a dam. Now it was the wrong dam. They got into the Bowman Dam uh, in upstate New York. Uh, and it was, I described this, this incident in the book because Michael Daniels told me he got the sort of proverbial 3 a.m. phone call from John Brennan who said they're in the Bowman Dam. Now it turns out there's two Bowman Dams. One of them is in New York and the other is in Oregon. The one in Oregon holds back a tsunami's worth of water and had uh, hackers unleashed the gates of that dam through uh, cyber means, which was entirely possible. They could have uh, unleashed what we would consider a deadly terrorist attack. Fortunately, they were in the other Bowman Dam, which holds back a babbling brook of water in New York and was under repair at the time. But it was a great example of a very close call. And we continue to have these very, very close calls, most recently with this hack of a water treatment facility in Florida, the Friday ahead of the Super Bowl, when a hacker got into the controls that um, the, the controls for chemical balance and increased the amount of lye, L-Y-E, in the water from 100 parts per million to 11,000 parts per million and could have badly poisoned something like 15,000 people and sent them to hospitals that are already under siege uh, from the pandemic. So, you know, my goal in writing this book was to go back, look at these incentive structures, look at where they've led us. And unfortunately where they've led us is to a place of further vulnerability. And I also wanted to write the book in a really accessible way. I really wanted to write this for my mom and my friends who have no computer science background because I wanted them to understand 
the stakes of these decisions that not only government has made, but also businesses um, and their rush to get products out to market and individuals in our daily lives where we all want and have grown accustomed to convenience and accessibility and the speed with which we can access everything from our smartphone. But clearly this all comes at a payoff um, and a trade-off. And typically that trade-off is done um, at the expense of security. So that was the goal with writing the book. I never expected, I, I was rushing to get it out ahead of the 2020 election. Fortunately, the 2020 election was not hacked. Um, and that was right when I finished the book. And then we have all found out that actually um, Russia was putting most of its attention not into the election, but into our federal IT networks and getting into government where they have been for the last nine months. And you know, solar winds, I hope, is the ultimate wake up call. You know, fortunately, the good news is that it was designed for espionage, we think. We think that they were after emails and strategy planning documents, typical traditional espionage. The bad news is, is that with the access they have for as long as they had it, it could be years before we can confidently say we've kicked these hackers out of our systems. If it is the agency that many suspect it is, a unit of the SVR, it's bad news. I mean, it's good news because this group has never been the same group of Russian hackers that turned off the lights in Ukraine or pulled off the NotPetya attack that hit Pfizer and Merck and Maersk um, and decimated systems in Ukraine, but all over the world. Yes, we are more of these quiet prowlers, quiet spies, but we also know them really well because they hacked the White House and the State Department in 2014, 2015, and I get into this a little bit in the book, but when I went back and spoke to the people who were remediating that attack, that is the incident response teams that were hired to come in and kick them out, they said it was the hardest uh, experience of their professional career. They described it as the equivalent of hand-to-hand -hand digital combat. At one point, they told me that the Russian hackers took over the RSA net witness investigatory tool that they used to find further backdoors and, and other Russian malware. They took it over and manipulated the tool so it wouldn't catch their backdoors. So once you know that story, you know just what a dangerous predicament we are in right now with the fact that these hackers were in our systems as far back as March, 2020, and we didn't discover them until late November, December. Um, we don't know how many other applications they might have compromised or where those back doors might be. And so the Biden administration has essentially just inherited a federal IT system and communication channels it can't trust. Um, that said, I'm also looking at it as a bit of a silver lining, because I think for the first time, we have no choice but to address the core problems with cybersecurity. You know, I watched the hearings the other day and I was actually quite uh, pleasantly surprised by the nuance uh, being brought into some of these conversations. Yes, they talked about um, simple sort of band-aid solutions like should we have a, a data breach notification law? Yes, we should have a data breach notification law. But also some of the questions were getting to the heart of the problems with the software supply chain. And in this case, you know, what, half of the victims that I called up and talked to after SolarWinds was discovered didn't even know they were using SolarWinds software, let alone that most of SolarWinds software is built, uh, tested, and maintained overseas in places like Belarus. That's not to say Belarus is fundamentally more dangerous, just that we have no idea what is in our network. We have no idea where that software is built and maintained, and we have no idea where the tools that make up the tools are being built and maintained. The problem is even worse in open source, um, which makes up such a high percentage of the tools we use in government, in Amazon. And we know that because of a few years ago when we discovered Heartbleed, uh, the gaping hole in the open SSL protocol that was used by the Pentagon, the FBI, Amazon. And when I dug into 
who was looking at and maintaining that code, it was literally two guys named Steve in the UK operating on this shoestring budget of something like $3,000 a year in donations. So I think for the first time, we are asking the right questions, which is how do we make sure everything that is touching our networks is secure? How do we make sure it's not a Trojan horse for some nation state attack? And once you start asking those questions, then you start getting to discussions around solutions like, do we need a bill of materials? Do we need to understand, um, you know, how, do we need a third party to come in and say, here is how secure this company's internal uh, commitment to security is, or they have no internal commitment to security, or they have a bug bounty program that allows hackers to come forward with information about holes in their code, or they have no program like that at all. Finally, we're asking these questions about um, the security of the tools that we're not just using for our communications, but the security of the tools that we're rolling into our critical infrastructure. And when I started writing this book, I felt like I was in a race against time to get this out into the average person's hands as we were racing towards the internet of things. And I think now, unfortunately, it took me seven years to do the book. We're way past that. Um, you know, we have already started installing our Alexas and our Google Homes and our Nests and our smart fridges and our smart cars. Um, but we are just on the cusp of artificial intelligence and true virtualization and machine learning. And so that is why this audience is, is really my target audience today is so we can have some of these conversations about the basics of security um, because until we do, it's almost pointless to have these conversations about international norms of behavior and what we can and cannot hack uh, in government, um, which is tricky when you're dealing with countries like Russia and China and Iran that rely on cyber criminals and contractors and even you know, engineers who work at Tencent by day, uh, but might moonlight for government operations at night and have a degree of plausibility that we don't have here, uh, where most of our attacks come out of cyber command and most of our espionage operations come out of the NSA and other intelligence agencies. So at the end of the book, I really just focus on the technology. Uh, what are the things we can do at the most basic level? Security by design, layered security, segmentation, multi-factor authentication, um, you know, and then you can get to these other conversations around, should we be buying uh, zero day exploits from organizations that also sell to our worst enemies? Should we be allowing former NSA hackers to take jobs overseas in Abu Dhabi um, where they're hacking on behalf of a foreign nation and Americans might be get caught in that dragnet, which is an episode that actually did happen that I describe in the book. Um, so, you know, none of these things are simple uh, conversations. They don't have a vaccine. We don't have a vaccine for cybersecurity. There's no silver bullet. Um, and so I really wanted to write a book that invited people from all sorts of industries and professions and fields and invite them into these conversations because unfortunately, the security community has not solved for this. And I think it's time that we crack open these discussions and start inviting people from fields we would never expect to offer their own opinions because the stakes just keep getting higher and higher. So with that, I'll probably stop there and open it up to questions. Great, thank you so much, Nicole. That's fascinating. And again, I. Strongly encourage anyone who's interested in this topic and whoops, there we go. And presumably you are by being part of this discussion. Um, the book is called, This is How They Tell Me the World Ends. Um, we do have uh, some questions uh, from the audience. Before we get to the audience, I wanted to uh, just check with the panelists and see if we have a couple of questions from, uh, from anyone uh, on, in our panelists group. Nicole, 
this, this is Kara. I, this is fascinating. And we really appreciate you coming and talking to us. One of the things we think a lot about is crit critical infrastructure when it comes to um, things like smart cities, right? And how you start to build more intelligent sensors across society. So, you know, we've talked about kind of other types of critical infrastructure. How do you see that explosion of, of smart cities amplifying the problem that you're talking about? Well, I just, this was top of mind for me this morning because I just, someone just sent me some research about the fact that ransomware is really hitting transportation systems. We talk a lot about hospitals because it's the most visceral example, but it's hitting transportation systems. And that hasn't really factored into our thinking about building smart cities. Um, a couple of years ago, I wrote a story based off an Argentine hacker's research where he actually went to DC and started hacking the stop the traffic lights um, and showed how easily that could be done. And when I wrote that story, I thought, okay, surely this is going to change the way that we're thinking about um, adding sensors to all of these systems for smart cities, but there was nothing. <laughs> there, was, there was just crickets after that. So yes, I mean, I think it's critically important that we talk about uh, the security and of, of adding sensors to anything we're doing, whether it's traffic lights or the power grid. Um, and, you know, unfortunately it just hasn't hit people yet. I think that any of these systems could be hacked. People think of it um, like a diehard movie, um, something so distant in the future. And I think, you know, the ransomware problem, that's something that people can really wrap their heads around. By this point, most people know what ransomware is. Um, and I think it was really actually interesting to hear Chris Krebs from CISA, formerly from CISA, talk about this. He said, you know, when he went out to these small or when they sent people out to these small municipalities and counties in rural America to talk about the, the need for paper backups or paper record of their ballot. Uh, because of potential nation state interference in the election. Everyone's eyes sort of rolled to the back of their head. But then they said, well, ransomware, you know, your, your election systems and check-in systems could be held up with ransomware. And that's when people said, oh yeah, ransomware. Someone in the next county over just had a problem with ransomware and I get that. And yes, okay, I, I get this. So, you know, the fact that ransomware is now hitting our transportation systems and our cities and schools in a big way, I think has been a big eye opener, at least for you know some of the people that are building these virtualized systems. But I don't have the answers there either. And you're probably closer to um, the discussions about how we secure those systems than I am. So if you you know have any anecdotes about what you're seeing, I'd love to hear them. Nicole, I have a question. This is Ashutosh, and uh, I I work in the five G area. Um, I don't know, I haven't read your book, look forward to reading your book. Have you touched up on any of the things in 5G, how, you know, new security threats, how can we uh, take care of those, uh, deter them, any mitigation controls, uh, things like that? I didn't get into it in the book, except for um, Huawei. You know, one of the things, Huawei, we've always accused Huawei of essentially being a um, massive Chinese PLA backdoor. Um, but one of the things I remind people of is that several years ago, David Singer and I broke the story about how the NSA um, had used Huawei as a backdoor. <laughs> we had broken into their systems in search of a PLA backdoor, but then once we were inside, uh, we realized that this offered immense espionage opportunities to hack our adversaries who don't typically want to use American software. So we were using Huawei as a supply chain vector mm -hmm. to hack our adversaries in North Korea and Sudan and Syria and uh, Iran. Uh, so it's just, it's just a fun fact, um, but you know, it also makes it really hard to figure out how to respond to the solar winds hack because you can't really call it an act of war when it's something that you yourself have done successfully for a very long time. But just in terms of 5, 5G, I mean, it is, it, it, we have not adequately communicated, I think, the threat and risks of 5G and on using foreign software uh, for 5G. And um, it really, to me, is a communications problem 
you know, I don't think it, the way that the U.S. government has sort of tried to bully some of our allies into not signing up for Huawei. I don't, we have offered no evidence, no proof, and it doesn't help that we ourselves have been caught hacking into these systems. So I really, I, I find it to be just a communications gap. I think we really need to do a better job communicating to, to people and businesses and our allies what the threats and risks look like um, and you know what, what, what the worst case scenario is and, and start proposing solutions other than don't use Huawei because I don't think that's possible uh, at this point in, in globalization. Thank you. Nicole, hi, this is Terry. I have a couple of questions. Uh, I really enjoyed your presentation and your book. I think that's the, the best, maybe the only place I've ever seen the zero day market explained in such depth and detail. And that was very helpful. Thank you for that. I have two questions. One is uh, very simple, and that is, um, how did you choose the title? Okay, so the title came to me in the shower, like all good ideas do. <laughs> and it came to me about 10 years ago and I wanted to keep it. And the reason it's called, this is, it's not, this is how the world will end. It's, this is how they tell me the world will end is, first of all, it gives me a degree of plausible deniability. <laughs> but also when I first got on this beat, what I heard from government officials and some people in industry over and over again is we're going to have a cyber 9-11. We're going to have cyber Pearl Harbor. They were almost screaming it at me. And I described this in the book, but it was almost comical because I would ask them, okay, so how long until we can expect, expect this cataclysmic uh, cyber induced kinetic explosion? And they always had the same answer. It was always 18 to 24 months, 18 to 24 months, just far enough you know, that I might forget and not hold them to it if it didn't happen, but just close enough to add urgency. And so this is how they were telling me the world would end with this sort of cyber 9-11. And the book is really my own learning journey, along with trying to hold the reader's hand and walk them through their own uh, journey. And what I found at the end was, I don't think that the cyber Pearl Harbor analogy is very useful. Um, but not for the reasons that others have, have called it out for over the years. I think we didn't see the Japanese planes coming. We have seen the cyber equivalent coming for more than a decade, and it hasn't hit us yet, but I also find it to be a, quite a distraction from where we already are. You know, we haven't had the chemical plant explosion yet. We haven't had the trains colliding because someone manipulated uh, the rail controls. Um, we uh, haven't had the contaminated water incident, although there was one at the beginning uh, of the pandemic in Israel that Israel accused Iran of, of doing to their own water systems and they caught it in time. And now we just caught this other attack on our water treatment facility in time. But I think it's all just a distraction from where we already are, which is everything worth intercepting in the United States has already been intercepted our intellectual property, our personal data, our financial data, our hospitals are being held up with ransomware, our grid, you know, the Department of Homeland Security published a screenshot a few years ago of Russian hackers literally with their fingers on the switches of our power grid. They've broken into Wolf Creek nuclear plant. Um, so, you know, where we are is pretty bad, but we're just sort of two clicks away from the explosion. And so, you know, by the end of the book, this is my takeaway is, hey, everyone, wake up. Let's not wait for the explosion to happen. Let's open our eyes to where we already are. And where we already are is more akin to a plague like COVID than it is to a Pearl Harbor event because it is invisible until you feel it or it reaches out and touches you. But we're so close <laughs> in so many of these cases to real destruction that could affect lives. And so that's that's the sort of long story yeah, behind yeah, the title. I, I really agree with that. I, I think uh, we've been distracted too long by cyber uh, Pearl Harbor. And I, I think you your insights on that are extremely valuable. I think I'm glad you wrote that. Uh, in such detail. My, my other question, you talk about the vulnerabilities equities process, which is a really big uh, deal within the US government. And my question is, and you talked about it in the, your presentation, the moral hazard that the government has um, in pursuing vulnerabilities in commercial software that um, the vendors don't know about and that may impact American systems as well. 
what is the answer to that in your view? I mean, if the government discovers a vulnerability that can be used to produce very important intelligence for U.S. policymakers, uh, there's clearly a risk in exposing American systems who have that same vulnerability. But by the same token, there is potentially a lot of value to be gained from that. Mm -hmm. And I'm so glad you talked about Rob Joyce and the process that he tried to set up mm -hmm. in 2017 to have a, uh, an interagency process to discuss the trade-off between keeping it secret and using it for offense versus telling the company so they can patch the vulnerability and have better defense. Mm -hmm. uh, it is, a, it is a, a dilemma, I think, for the decision makers. What's your view on, on how that should go? Should it be stopped? Um, how should it work or should it work at all? Yeah, it's a great question. And it, it's the question at the heart of the book. And it's one of the reasons I wrote the book because there are no easy answers to that question. And I do really think that is a particular dilemma that is worthy of bringing to people in other fields to discuss, you know, how do we handle these questions when it comes to bioterrorism or, you know, other, other fields I think would be very useful here. But here's my take. I mean, first of all, you really have to credit the US government for having a vulnerability equities process in the first place. I assume, although I don't know that no one in Iran is sitting around a mahogany table debating whether to turn over a zero day exploit in Microsoft Windows <laughs> to Microsoft or not. So it's good that we have this process. And I have interviewed everyone who led this process from Howard Schmidt, who unfortunately is no longer with us, but was lovely to talk to about this process and how it began under the uh, w administration and then i i talk in the book about visiting michael daniel at at the white house when he was leading this process and was clearly exhausted and um and then i interviewed him again after he left office and it was clear he had some regrets about some of the decisions that were made through the vep process so what do we do um and i think it's really useful to talk in concrete terms about eternal blue which was the uh, zero day exploit uh, in Microsoft Windows software that was dumped online by the shadow brokers, whoever they are, we still don't know, um, and then picked up by North Korea and Russia and used for these very destructive attacks that cost American businesses and everyone else something like $10 billion. So before that happened, before Eternal Blue, this Microsoft zero day exploit was dumped online, we were told through public remarks, and, there, and no one really talked about this too publicly until Rob Joyce really made a serious effort to. Um, but you know, we were told that for the most part, the US government was turning over these exploits and vulnerabilities to the companies, that they turned over more than 90% of them to manufacturers, and that they had a criteria, which they only published after Heartbleed uh, was disclosed and um, Bloomberg accused the NSA of knowing about this open SSL vulnerability and using it for its operations, which the NSA just denied. And Michael Daniel put out this criteria for the first time to say, here's how we decide uh, whether to keep or turn over a zero day. And according to Michael Daniel at the time, the, the criteria were this. It was, uh, how difficult is it to exploit this vulnerability? Is this something that any low level cyber criminal could exploit if they discovered it. And if it's easy to exploit, then that will err on the side of turning it over to the vendor. Uh, how widely deployed is the software? If it's more widely deployed, then that would bias us in favor of turning it over. Um, you know, if, if this was discovered by an adversary, how destructive could it be to Americans and American infrastructure and businesses. If it's going to be highly destructive, we will turn it over. And finally, how damaging to our relationship with industry, with the Microsoft and Googles of the world, would it be if it became known that we held on to a flaw in their system for a long time? And they told me they would revisit these decisions around the zero days they kept periodically to ask ourselves, is it really necessary that we're still using this? But when Eternal Blue was dumped online and then used by our adversaries, it made very clear that everything that they had told us about this process was not applied in this case. 
um, we know how damaging it was in the hands of our adversaries because it cost $10 billion. You know, that year, one of the things I always flag is Merck actually had to dip into the CDC's emergency stockpile of Gardasil vaccine that year because its vaccine production lines were decimated in that cyber attack. Uh, you know, it cost FedEx something like $400 million. Um, it was in Microsoft Windows, the most widely used software we use. Uh, you know, so all of these, these supposed criteria we were using sort of fell apart when you looked at it through the lens of eternal blue. The other thing that really struck me was we knew how destructive this could be in adversaries' hands because when I went back and interviewed some of the TAO, that's the NSA hacking unit, when I interviewed some of them, I said, you know, did you know how dangerous this would be if it got out? And they said, yes, we compared it to fishing with dynamite, but it was getting some of the best counterintelligence we could get. You wouldn't believe the information and intelligence it was pulling back for us. So we never seriously considered turning this over to Microsoft. The other thing is we held on to it for more than five years, five years, you know, so so clearly the system and the process broke down in this case, or at the end of the day, we just decided the intelligence we're getting from this is so good, we can't get it any other way. So we're not even gonna consider bringing it to the process at all. So by the end of the book, the recommendations I make are, um, and again, I am not a technical person. So people are free to criticize me for having any opinion on this at all, but, through my research, my recommendations are not that we should automatically turn over every zero day exploit that we find, but that we should really hold it to this criteria. And we should bring more civilian agencies into the discussions around, around whether to keep or turn over these zero days, because increasingly we're seeing ransomware hit transportation systems like we were just talking about and hospitals. So why not bring in a representative from the Department of Health and Human Services or the Department of Transportation into these conversations. Because until now, they've really been biased towards the NSA. You know, yes, the person who uh, I think leads the, the conversations is the person who heads up the NSA's information assurance, you know, division, the, the defensive side of the house, but they're still at the NSA. And so why not bring in more representatives from some of these civilian agencies who can speak to the fact that if you're leaving a vulnerability open in these systems, it could be used to hit a hospital or railway system or airport, et cetera, et cetera. So that's one. The other is, you know, now we have more research. Rand did a study that showed that, uh, you know, at some point, zero days, um, I forget what the exact numbers are, so don't quote me, but you know, after a year, something like a quarter of, of zero days are ultimately discovered. So let's, let's do more research on zero day collision rates. Let's try and understand what is the time horizon uh, under which a zero day is ultimately discovered and used in the wild. And let's apply that to our decision making process and the BEP process. And let's make sure if we're holding on to a zero day exploit, that we're only holding it on, holding on to it for half that period of time. Let's not hold on to it for five years, especially if it's in a software like Microsoft, because you know it used to be a theoretical, like what if a cyber criminal or nation state found this and used it against us? But it's no longer a theoretical because we're seeing nation state attacks on our infrastructure almost every single day, and we're seeing cyber criminals ransomware our hospitals every other week. So you know these are real threats. Um, they are happening all the time. And so I think we need to bring in uh, you know, a different perspective or, or people who are more biased towards defense than those who've typically been represented in the process. But it's not an easy, it's not an easy topic. And it's so fascinating to me. And I, I remember when I told people I was writing a book about the zero day market and the vulnerability equities process, they said, you know, how could you possibly make that interesting? And I just thought, how could you not? You know, the, these these discussions, they're so, the stakes are only getting higher, and um, you know, they're affecting all of us. So it's it's really really a fascinating area for discussion. Uh, thank you for that. Um, I just one of our uh, attendees pointed out that the equities review process at NSA really started back in the 1990s. Yes, and it worked very well, just the way along the lines you described for many years. It might still be working if um, you know Eternal Blue hadn't been stolen and revealed to the world. Mm -hmm. but, yeah. 
Thank you for that answer. Yeah, and, and Michael Hayden has actually talked a lot about Nobus, you know, the nobody but us, um, which was the original starting point for some of these discussions inside NSA. And after my book published, I've gotten more notes from people inside companies like Google and others saying, actually, they, they have been pretty good about turning over some critical vulnerabilities in our code to us on the sly, um, but we can never talk about it publicly. So one of the recommendations I make in the book is, can we assign more public credit to the agencies that turn over the zero days to increase public trust in the fact that we are doing the right thing in a lot of these cases? Because usually when the NSA would turn over a vulnerability, and by the way, they did in the case of Eternal Blue a month before um, you know, these tools were leaked, they did tell Microsoft about it, but of course by then no one had, had patched their systems or at least not all of their systems. Um, but can we credit, you know, when they, when they turned it over, they didn't give themselves credit and, you know, that, that might go a long way to giving the agencies the benefit of the doubt. Thank you. Cool. Yes. Thank you. This has been fascinating. Uh, we've had some great questions from the audience. We won't be able to get to ranging from, uh, cyber, uh, crypto backdoors to, how broadly cyber operations could spread among nation states aside from the ones we're seeing today, the extent of the impact of cyber, uh, cyber conflict and cyber operations, um, even whether large, what the prospect of large companies purchasing uh, zero day vulnerabilities to um, exploit weaknesses of other companies or discredit them. A lot of um, interesting time, and the regulatory environment as well. So a lot of things that unfortunately we won't be able to get to, but very, very important topics. So once again, uh, I would really like to thank you for your time and the, the interesting uh, information. Oh, one last thing, please let people know, someone asked the best way to purchase your book. So can't leave without. Oh. Thank you. I mean, thank you so much for all of those questions. And hopefully I you know, answer some of them in the book, but the buying zero day exploits to hack other companies is not one I explored, but might have to for the pages of the New York Times. Um, but if you do buy my book, my favorite way to purchase it is through Bookshop, which allows you to purchase it through indie booksellers, um, or you can always purchase it directly from booksellers like Powell's or your local bookstore. It's, it's everywhere. So um, yeah, but support your local bookstore. Nicole, thank you once again, and uh, and we'll see you in the New York Times. Okay, thank you so much, Tony, and everyone. Really, really appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for joining us.